So I'm back here with the pie. I've been uh, messing about today, cleaning and stuff like that. I'll put some pictures of the state that the, um, <laughs> the, the chassis was in with this horrible black stuff that was all over the top of it. And um, <clears throat> that cleaned it out with, you know, brushed it down with a paintbrush and um, some white spirit. And of course that stinks, so it takes ages for that smell to dissipate quite a lot before you really want it indoors and to work on it. I can still smell it now. Um, and just getting familiar with the circuit, really, and having a look about. Um, first schoolboy error I made, although it doesn't actually matter in this case, but this valve, this, this uh, valve amp has eight different valves, plus the magic eye, which is just out of shot down here, which is, again, one of those mullards, the mullard M EM34, M ME34, uh, EM, iMagic34. The mullard, which is just there in shot, the red one, which are like duck's teeth, and people are charging a fortune for those on on eBay, which is just a pain in the neck. But anyway, um, so we've got one one thing I did, which was my my schoolboy error, was um, I didn't take the valves out before I wiped down the surface, which has got this horrible black had this it's really sticky horrible almost like a muddy oily kind of top all over the uh the surface so i you know it's just horrible to work on when something something that is that dirty um so you have to do it but of course i didn't think and when you're using white spirit or whatever with a paintbrush in between all the, the valves and i hadn't removed them um you can you wipe off the actual silk screen or the decals from the type from the valves which obviously that can be a pain because then when you do take them out especially with the val a valve amp with eight in them like this plus the rectifier diode so there's nine in here well plus the magic eye rather so there's nine in total but eight valves on the actual chassis um and then going to read them and of course i'd rubbed off there was only one i could make out but what's really nice which i know is blurred in the shot but there's a the panel that they put on the back here which is really nice with pi They've actually got a chassis layer on top here, which you can barely make out, but you'll just have to trust me that each of these is the valves marked, and it says what type they are. So it's really nice to have that panel on there, because obviously I'd have been in a bit of trouble if I, I'd have had to have written them down or write them on a pad, and then I, I just happened to notice that little diagram there. Oh, and that, obviously, at the back there is the EM34, which is the Magic Eye, uh, back there. So, really nice layout for, uh, for Pi. So anyway, what's going on with this thing? Unfortunately, I can't show you the chassis in this shot, and I can't lift it up in any way. You can see this thing is, is a good over a foot from top to bottom of the chassis. Um, and I've got it resting on this toolbox, so at least I've got an angle to be able to see inside and have to use the side light here. So, it's it, you know, because it's such a big unit, it's, it's, it's a pain to have on the bench. Um, and without an overhead camera that can zoom in any way, um, it's all a bit pointless. I'd have to rig up a, a, a jig for this thing. Um, but anyway, what, what was the issue with it? Because in the previous video, we did the dim bulb testing, and obviously it was dead. There was nothing, there was no, um, nothing happening at all, and there's a really simple reason for that. There was, um, there was just one of the transformer wires on the mains primary had actually was just sort of worn away and had just come off, its, uh, off, off the switch contact. And it took me ages to spot it. Um, you know, I was looking at other stuff and this sort of thing, thinking, what the hell's going on with this switch here? And then I just happened to see that the wire wasn't even, it was it was right next to it, the actual solder joint point, but it wasn't soldered onto it. It was loose. So I resoldered that. So now you can see uh, the actual switch on knob and the, select, the selector switch and mains, mains um, control. If I switch that now, you'll see that switch is on. And I've got the, the connections actually onto the plug terminals here, which is where well, they're a bit crappy brass, brass they've got not very, you know, bit worn, uh, got a bit of tarnish on them, so they're not the greatest connection. But anyway, now that you can see, if I flick the switch off, we go open circuits, flick the switch on, and we go to 34 ohms, um, which is the mains primary. Um, I've tested... Uh, the other windings on the mains primary and get various readings. None of them are completely short circuit, so but they'd be the other windings that you'd have available for your different voltages. So this is the actual 240 volt, which is a 
it's still nice and tight but it's all been cleaned up as well and that all checks through. So what I'm still going to do now, I'm in a position with this main switch working. I, because I was in here, I thought just out of interest, I have tested some of the capacitors. Now the mains filter caps, I'll also put a picture up of where they are sitting across the circuit, the actual filter caps. They're the two in the cans here at the back. There's a tall can um, back here. I don't know if you can see. No, my, the, the other valve's in the way. But there's a slightly taller can here and another silver can here. And they've got, um, according to the circuit diagram, they've got um, 32 microfarad and 16 microfarad uh, capacitors inside them, uh, which I'll put the picture up of where they sit in the actual circuit. But they are looking like, I've tested them with, the, with my uh, ESR meter, and they're both coming up as damaged, or one actually came up as a MOSFET, just because it's in parallel with other stuff. Um, so obviously the beside it really threw threw the beside uh, meter off completely there. It didn't know what the hell it was reading. So to come up and say it was a, was a MOSFET, which was strange, but that was fun. Um, so what I'm going to do, I am actually now in a position to to you know fire this thing up with the uh, mains bulb, the dim bulb tester, knowing that we've actually got faults. So I'm just as curious because obviously there'll be there's no point trying to you know get this correct anyway because it would take way too long to order more caps, the, you know, the 350 volt uh, mains ones. But just out of interest, I thought you'd, you'd want to see this. One of this, there's a little wire hanging out here. And that is the end of this wax capacitor, which is horrible, which again, because of the blurry camera, you probably can't see, but at the right angle, you might see, and it's actually where the cap's blown off the end. It's actually, you can see the wax sort of spewing out the end of this and this is a uh, this is a what is it it's a 0.25 microfarad at 350 volts DC so you know that typical uh, typical uh, electrolytic that th these are the waxes that Paul Carlson always says you know any waxes you just get out of there immediately this one though isn't important um, I'm leaving this wire on so I know where it attaches to the switch but this one isn't important these go across the switch and therefore, uh, for arcing across the switch, basically, they're just caps to allow the, um, the mains transformer to discharge without sparking across the switch and wearing the switch out. So they're not critical, and there's a couple of others in the circuit for that too. So this one doesn't seem to be on the circuit, and it's not on the list, but it was, it was definitely attached, and it was attached by one of the actual, um, one of these actual clips. So it definitely should be there. But it, I can't find its value exactly in the, in the capacitor list because there's there's two uh, micas at, at uh, uh, and one of those was actually disconnected as well. But there's two micas that actually go from they're centre tapped and go to each side of the primary as well for that switching function to for the uh, for the mains um, transformer to discharge back through across the actual switches. To, to save the switch contract contacts, but anyway, because they're not important, that you know they're not critical for the operation of the the, uh, the unit. So what I'm going to do is I'll leave that in on mode now, so I know the actual main switch is on. The rest of the switches here are, are obviously presets, um, something like that. Uh, there was only one casualty in the dismantling process, which was breaking off of the knob here, but there's enough surface area for that to be uh, glued back on, because that is rusted solid on, on there, I don't, you just can't see that on the actual, on the shaft of the uh, the tuner mechanism, which now is nice and smooth, because everything got sprayed and cleaned, it got, I sprayed it with WD-40 at first to stop the squeaking, and then it got sprayed with contact cleaner, so that's really heavy now, and just nice and smooth. Um, so the actual, obviously not that I'm expecting to tune anything in in this session, but um, we're just going to see what happens. So I'll pause the video, make sure that's switched back to on. I'll set up the <coughs> dim bulb tester and I'm going to, you know, we'll still be in that position as if we were testing an unknown amp, although obviously I do know there is other issues with this. So that'll make it interesting as well to see what the dim bulb actually does. Should it, at least one of the... the uh, well, it came up on the B-side meter as actually being fault, you know, um, faulty components. 
So whether they fail short or not, but again, that the whole process and one of the benefits of using a dim bulb tester, if I'm going to bring it up on the 20 watt bulb, and if it doesn't short out catastrophically, or, or, you know, well, that's the whole point of the dim bulb tester. It should protect it from that, and then it just let's see if. if um, it will actually, the capacitors can reform at these lower and lower volumes, uh, lower, lower volumes, lower levels of voltage. And so I'll go through the whole set as well, because to give this thing a fighting chance that maybe the capacitors will reform just enough or not um, to get to a, the highest voltage before, uh, you know, the bulb, the dim bulb stays lit and draws all of the current should any of these fail short. And we'll see what the consequences of that are too, whether there's smoke or, or whatever, because I don't know. I've never, um, you know, been in this situation where I've, I've had a catastrophic failure, except once on an old valve radio where, and it was just sat on the desk anyway, it was upright, all encased in the chassis, and I just turned it in on the mains, and I heard it, you know, heard a pop and switched it off. And when I looked underneath, it had a load of paper capacitors and they'd all just exploded into a complete carbon mess that just stuck all over everything. It was just like everything had burnt black and exploded um, inside. Um, so this is the sort of thing that we're trying, that, why you use a build, dim bulb tester to try and avoid this these kind of situations. So anyway, I'll get that set up and then we'll come back and um, hopefully be in a position, at least uh, just for now. And I, I'll leave each dim bulb on for 15 minutes at each stage. Okay, I'm about to hit the power and see what happens with the dim bulb. So, we're reading it's only 67, 70 volts mains across the actual switch. You see that initial surge of the dim bulb. Try and get that into view there. So the unit is actually taking more and more voltage, but it's leveled out at 97 volts AC being fed to across the switch, the main switch to the unit. And actually now you can start to see I'm measuring across the actual filter capacitors that obviously tested faulty but it wasn't definitive because um, you know they would have been very discharged and probably not in a very good state but now you can actually see voltage climbing this is DC voltage climbing I'm on the thousand volt range you just can't see out of the picture there but this is now actually climbing as is the actual mains voltage uh, being fed to the unit because that started what at about just 60 to start it's now drawing more and more current presumably as some of those filter caps are starting to reform so the dim bulb um, has actually dimmed a little bit compared to the brightness that it was when it first switched on but you wouldn't be able to tell that through the camera anyway but it's actually a lot it's dim enough for me to see the filament inside the dim bulb now but when I first switched it on it was very bright so obviously drawing a lot of current sort of a, almost effectively a short circuit because of the state the the duff capacitors are in in a discharge really poor state um, but now we're holding DC at 60 volts DC across the filter capacitors so it seems at least I know that the mains transformer one mains transformer is working both primary and secondary sides the filter caps are holding enough charge now for it actually start to climb so they're reforming and obviously by definition if there's DC voltage here that's slowly climbing there's DC getting onto the B plus rail so that means that um, valve, which valve was it, I can't remember, I think it's valve, this one, um, the rectifier diode, uh, presumably that's the EZ40, the EZ40 would be the rectifier, which would be that one. So, so far so good, so we're on 68 volts, I'm going to leave this, I'll stop the video and I'm going to leave this now 
for, well, I'm in no rush, so I'll, I'll give it a good uh, 15 minutes, because as we saw yesterday with the dim bulb test from scratch, we know that the, the 20 watt, 25 watt bulb and the 40 watt bulbs and the 60 watt bulbs actually do quite a fair amount of limiting. So I think um, I'll, I'll leave this first one while it's still climbing and still making progress here. I'm just going to leave this until this actually settles out, whether it's 15 minutes, half an hour, whatever. I'm going to leave it until I don't see any more voltage climbing, DC voltage climbing on this meter. And when I'm happy that that's stabilized and not climbing anymore, then I'll shut the unit off, or I, well, just by taking the bulb out. Um, I'll swap the bulb over, and then I'll go to the 40 watt bulb, and we'll do the same again and see if we can actually get this thing measuring both the DC rail uh, for each bulb against the actual volt, the AC voltage that's applied to the unit for each bulb as we step through the process. So here's just an interesting thing I thought I'd, I'd mention again because I'm. Not too many people actually talk about it on sort of tube amp videos, but it's really important concept for anybody, any valve techs that um, you know mess around with either amps or radios, is the concept of the RMS value and what it means. It means root mean square, and basically, without going too much into the maths, it means that when you have a sine wave, there is a relationship between a sine, obviously a circle and a sine wave, because that's how a sine wave is defined, is from the rotational value of the circuit regarding the height of the radius and stuff like that. So basically what you have, when you have a, uh, a sine wave on the mains input, if it's 240 volts RMS, it, that means it's sort of the equivalent value of work that would be done for a DC circuit measuring 240 volts DC. However, with AC, there is a peak value that goes above the, to the RMS value, and that value is calculated by being the root mean square value. And what that means is, if you take the square root, I know this is blurry on this crappy camera, you can probably barely see it, but if you the square root of 2 and do the equals, it, it's 1.414. So that number is really worth remembering. And it's reciprocal. If you divide that 1 by 1.414, you get 0 0.707. And they're really important numbers just to remember, because what this means is 1.414, if you multiply that by any RMS value, you get the peak value. So in the case of 240 volts mains you, here in the UK, if we multiplied this one, the square root of 2, which is 1.414, if you multiply that by 240 volts, you get 339.5, near as damn it, 5 volts. And I remember that number because from doing this calculation. So the peak value, not peak to peak, but just the peak of one side, if you've got 240 volts RMS going up one way, and then you've got negative 240 volts coming down the other way, that means you have a peak value of 300, let's say 340 volts one side, and then minus 340 volts the other side. So the peak to peak value of that those would actually be 680 volts peak to peak. But obviously one cycle comes, one half cycle comes after the other. So what that means is that peak value, when it's converted to DC by a rectifier circuit, assuming you have a one to one transformer. So you get 240 volts being fed to the primary and you're getting 240 volts coming out of the secondary. The peak value that the capacitors will be charged to, the filter capacitors, after the rectifier, diodes, will be a minimum around about 339.5 volts. Slightly less because of losses and stuff. But that's the minimum value. And that's why we're always talking around the 340 30, 330, 340 volts DC value that you will get in almost any piece of valve equipment as a minimum because that's, you know, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a mains transformer that's got a, a step down secondary when you're dealing with valves. They nearly always need to have a much more voltage to drive, you know, say big power amps and stuff like that. So even with a one-to-one -one transformer, you'll, and you get 240 volts in and 240 volts AC out, the, out of the secondary, when it's rectified to DC, you're going to get a minimum of around about 340 volts DC 
that's rectified by that first filter capacitor, which is, of course, a lethal value of DC. And that's the minimum that you're likely to encounter on the actual B+. So that's how that relationship works. So why did I tell you that now? Well, if you look now, we're still on the same 20 watt bulb. It's actually climbed now as these capacitors are reforming and it's holding charge across the DC rail and not discharging through the faulty capacitors as they're slowly reforming and working again. It's now charged to 106 volts DC, still on, this one's reading, I said it's a 1,000 volt range, this one's reading is on the 750 volt AC range to read the mains voltage that's actually getting to the radio. So that means, let's call it 100 volts, that means there'd be about 140 volts across the bulb and near as damn it 100 volts going to the radio for AC. So, using that calculation again, if I, I, I will know that the maximum it's possible for the DC B plus circuit to charge with these capacitors, if they were, even if they were fully working, the maximum is going to be, this is stable at 95 volts RMS. So if I do that calculation again and go square root of 2, which is equal to 1.4, and multiply it for this bulb as we are at the moment by 95 volts RMS AC, that peak value is going to be 134 volts. So that is the maximum with this particular bulb, the maximum that this B plus rail on this radio could charge to if left long enough and it actually got there, which it probably won't, but it will. it's not possible for it to actually go above 134 volts DC on the B plus rail with this particular bulb in. So I'm still going to leave it because it's still climbing occasionally. It's slowing down a lot, but it's still climbing. So while it's still climbing, those capacitors are reforming. Um, and I'm going to just let it see how where it levels out, knowing that it, it, providing it still climbs, the maximum I could get. And when I get there, then obviously I'd know that I could definitely stop and change to the next bulb up. So I hope that kind of clarifies a few things or just helps people get a better understanding See, it's just gone up to 107 now, so it's still very slowly climbing as the capacitors hold more and more charge um, and are able to take more. And then, so I'll leave it for a good, you know, I'll just leave it until I'm happy that I feel that this is as high as it's going to get below this value, where it's really stable for quite a long time, and before I move up to the next bulb um, and go from there. So I'll come back when uh, the next bulb's ready to go. Okay. Um, I'm back to uh, about to change from the 25 watt bulb to the 40 watt bulb. Um, so we just thought we'd have a look at these figures and see uh, what's gone on. So it's going to get exponentially slower to charge now, obviously, as these capacitors reform and the voltage across them opposes the voltage that's charging them. But it's actually climbed, as you can see, to 121 volts, still with a mains voltage of around 95, 96. So um, that's been an hour to, to get to that point. So I'm going to shut down and put the next little 40 watt bulb in and go again and see where we are. So I'll just pause for a minute and change the bulbs. I uh, just thought I'd log that while I, I just counted a, uh, to the seconds clock that I can hear ticking and it dropped to 15 volts. It's quite slow, this one, to discharge uh, this unit, even at that such a low voltage. So it went from, it took one minute to go from 120 volts down to 15 so quite slow. Um, so uh, basically, we'll uh, swap the bulb over. Let's cool down after a minute. So got the 40 watt in there now, and see what happens now with the uh, with the flash. If the so watch out for the initial um, brightness, and hopefully then we see it dim out, and then I can leave it again for another long period of time and see see where we are. Okay, not very much of a flash. Um, the, the bulb's not bright at all. Um, I can see the filament perfectly well through the glass. Um, you can probably just about see it now, where it was in very bright initially. But you can see immediately now that 40 watt bulb has, has allowed from the voltage, the AC voltage being fed to the unit to go up to 140 volts RMS. 
um, AC from the 95, 96 volts or so that the 20 watt bulb is and already now we can see the DC rail has climbed to 160 volts uh, and climbing up nicely now. So let's just grab the calculator um, and see what we'd expect now. Let's say that that's uh, going to stabilize out around the 133 volts mark or so. So square root of 2 which is equal, let's start again, so square root of 2 is equal to 1.414 and multiply that by 133 volts input RMS and we get 188 let me just see that, it's 188 volts which should be the maximum that this could possibly charge the uh, rectifier filter capacitors to um, which is actually getting up there pretty quickly already now look it's at 773 volts out of a possible 188 max for 133 volts RMS input so um, gonna leave that there I think you know we're gonna get as these caps reform and get better and, and better at holding charge I think we'll uh, you know see them be able to get quicker and quicker up to higher and higher values up to a point where who knows they may actually just fail at some point and just go um, if they're too stressed or just because they're not in very good condition so at any time on any bulb it, it could happen so pretty interesting uh, situation to to actually witness this for the first time for me um, and hopefully you guys as well and I hope you you know you have a bit better appreciation of how beneficial the humble dim bulb tester is in potentially giving that lease of life at least temporarily to to know that a, a unit is fully working and also um, I didn't show you before because I didn't notice it immediately but if I just tilt this a bit this way there's three out of the four uh, there's the fourth bulb down there that one I think it was on just briefly but that's black now so that one's blown but I've actually got three of the panel bulbs are actually working too on this unit so so that's a, uh, an added bonus because I've actually got some spares as well still from the last um, radio so I'll be able to, to change uh, that bulb at some point so anyway gonna leave this now for however long it takes and see where, where it gets to and then move up to the 60 watt bulb after Right, I'm just going to switch off now at 164 volts DC. Um, count down for a minute, see how we, what time it takes to, for, uh, what it discharges down to in this uh, time of one minute, and then go to the 60 watt bulb. But it literally went from 160 uh, that it was, 165, down to 5 volts in about less than 10 seconds. So I'm going to go up to the 60 watt now. and see what happens so let's fire up so we have the initial just the initial surge of that inrush current and then the dim down the 60 watt bulbs brought her up now to around about 185 volts mains dropping down as the Probably the tubes are, have started, you know, been in emission now as well. That's ah, yeah, that that makes sense. What happens there? I know why that discharged quickly on the last bulb. There would have been enough DC voltage to turn the valves on, so they'd have been actually in emission and actually working as part of the circuit. Um, whereas for the 25 watt bulb, they wouldn't have been switched on, which is why it took so long to discharge in comparison. The 40 watt bulb was enough to bring them into emission, which means when you switch off they are a conductive path down to ground so that's why the circuit can discharge much more rapidly through all the valves that are actually switched on um, so that's what's happening there um, so now we're at 160 uh, volts RMS so the calculation for that will be uh, 160 volts Let's uh, see what we could expect 
a maximum of so we've got 160 volts RMS multiplied by square root of 2 so 226 volts DC would be the maximum that the DC rail could go up to with 160 volts RMS in so I'll let that cook for uh, yeah maybe five minutes more I, I don't see much point and as we you know I said yesterday uh, if the unit's gonna fail which I don't know I just get a feeling about this out I don't know maybe I'm wrong I think it's gonna be okay um, it said it's in very good nick underneath there was only a couple of cobwebs not a lot of the underneath being protected from all of that crap the insides of this which I'll put a photo of in this video it's actually pretty tidy um, and it's got a lot of, uh, I think they're Bradleys, are they called? Um, certainly not the dog bone ones that, uh, you know, drift with age, but the, the resistors are all the cut-off ones that Paul Carlson reckons, uh, you know, are very stable, or relatively stable. And it looks like the capacitors, there's only about six electric, electrolytics in this unit, and it looks like they're actually reforming pretty well. Um, certainly so far, there's, you know, there's no shorts and so the unit has only had the one bulb failure and doing pretty well so um, I'll give this another few minutes and then we'll make the jump to the more critical one which is probably the first if anything's going to fail I'd expect it to be at the 100 watt or the 150 so we'll get the 100 watt in um, in, a, in a minute or so or a few minutes and, um, and go from there Right, I'm going to switch off and just watch the, how quickly the discharge happens now that we know that the valves are actually in emission. So there you go, she's off, see how quick, bang, down to zero, close to zero in seconds. So I'm going to move to the 100 watt bulb now and because what the other thing now I'm thinking is that um, 177 volts DC is probably reaching the actual design limit uh, for the DC rail for this particular unit because the V door I think was only 200 and something I can't remember now 212 or whatever it was maybe 220 max not even so it's not necessary you know once you get to the actual design specifications of the particular valves that are in a particular unit then there's no reason for the DC rail to go any higher than that so it's probably getting close to a 177 so just regardless of what the mains input it's probably going to start to flatline out at, at, at you know not much more than this anyway. So I may as well just move up through now because it wasn't looking like it's certainly quite trying to climb any quicker. So um, let's get the hundred watt in. This isn't too hot to to touch. So jumping up to the hundred, and here we go. Watch for the flash, and any pops maybe if the cap goes. Right, so as we saw doing the uh, the dim bulb video that I did yesterday, um, as you can see the 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 well the the proportion between the voltage that goes across the bulb now is starting to shift to more voltage being across the unit under test, which we can see now because it's got 194 volts RMS across it, and the rail voltage is now jumped up to 222 which is higher than I expected but that's probably getting to be more or less what it would be when she's up and running fully so we'll leave that for a few minutes um, again just to get the uh, caps reformed as much as possible at that voltage I'm starting to see obviously you can see the filament now as the units stabilizing out and the voltages are being shared the available voltage is being shared so now we know there's closer to 200 volts across well it's 190 so we've only got 50 volts across the bulb across the 100 watt bulb now but we can actually see you know see the filament glowing inside there so uh, we're not far off if she survives the um, the next bulb the 150 watt bulb I'll let that cook for five minutes and then I'm pretty you know confident that this thing can handle full mains on its own and then what I'll do is um, I'll plug the speaker in um, the volume's down at the minute and so I may as well just talk about that for a second because um, I think that's a bit of a mystery for some people with valve amps because there's a lot of well some some you know you hear different stories about what people think about um, how 
the output stage and the output valves whether they need a load or not. Um, you can run valve amps without a speaker attached provided the volume is down because then obviously there's no signal being sent to the output transformers secondary winding that would that usually let's say they've got a um, an AC inductance of around about 2000 ohms um, if you do feed a signal to the output stage then you're putting a signal through the output transformer and that's obviously oscillating and that energy wants to go somewhere it's it's being stepped up from uh, stepped down from the actual primary the, the output stage the primary is the high voltage and then the secondary is the low voltage because it has to it transforms the higher current from the primary to uh, sorry a lower a higher voltage but lower current in the output transformer primary to a lower impedance um, higher output current to drive a speaker and if you don't have a load attached, that energy has got nowhere to go through the primary, through through the secondary of the output. So basically, it it tends to discharge. It it stresses the output tubes because and the output transformer because that energy has got nowhere to go. So yes, it's true that you should always have a speaker attached to an output stage of a valve amp, just because of the whole way that the that output power works. Um, which you don't have on transistor-based amps because it doesn't work the same way. They they haven't got a magnetic field built up because they use transistors as as the uh, as the power source for the output. Um, but with valve amps, because they're transforming uh, the output voltages in in a mains transformer that feeds the the output the output speaker, then that energy has to go somewhere and it will reflect back and can actually damage the output tubes if there's no load and you're feeding a large signal to the output tubes which then goes to the output transformer and then it has nowhere to go so but provided you've got the volume turned down you can you don't have to have a speaker attached because obviously there is no signal getting to the output stage because the volumes turned down at the previous stage so it's perfectly safe to do it so I will actually connect I'll probably have to get some crop clips and go from from here because these are the outputs to the speaker and they're not long enough because they're, they're actually in the in the case which um, has cleaned out okay now and the speaker looks really good uh, really good condition I'll show a picture of that as well that's me tapping it there it's really nice condition it's very you know it's really taut so uh, and it's a good old fair old speaker in there that's um, so it's got to be an eight inch cone in there so I should imagine this is a pretty basic unit and probably got very nice sound. So uh, we're at 210 volts and 190. So we're probably at the limit of the uh, the DC rails design limits anyway. So I think we can switch off. Again, watch for the how quickly the um, the DC rail comes down from that 209 volts DC. So look at that. Within five seconds, it's down really safe value down to uh, to 5 volts so um, I'll just pause you a minute and we'll, I'll get the I'll dig out the 150 watt bulb so here we go on the 150 watt bulb if it's gonna fail it would be now um, or actually put onto the mains after if it doesn't fail here so here we go so we've gone up to nearly full UK voltage here which is 240 volts we're at 237 and we're starting to climb now wow it's quite a high rail on this it's gone up to 270 near 270 volts so this has probably got a it'll, it'll drop a bit as the valves start to emit and the rest of the circuit starts to load the um, the B plus so it's looking at 215 AC so we've still got 35 volts to go uh, putting it into the mains and it's 237 I don't expect to see even on the mains that it should climb much higher than the B plus of around about what it is now so maybe up to 240 something like that but we'll see but it's uh, it hasn't failed well so you know there's no smoke or anything so um, I'll get it onto the mains we'll test it as it is at the moment right up until 
the mains voltage. You can just see the filament starting to glow now as the voltages are everything settling down and the voltages are splitting evenly between or proportionally between the, the, uh, the two different loads of the, of the two different resistances of the unit and the, and the light bulb. And then we'll put it in, I'll leave this for a couple of minutes just to see what's going on and then I'll plug it straight into the mains and see what happens there. And if it seems stable enough there, um, I'll plug the speakers in and then we'll listen and see because uh, this is actually free to move. I've got the tuner here. Um, you can just see the capacitor turning there nice and smoothly, not the not the horrible racket that it made the first day when it was all crusty and horrible. So that's all smoothed off now. And um, uh, where are we? 228 and 211. So we've got 30 volts more to go on the mains input. Um, so for what it's worth, I think uh, I can't see that we're going to get any more out of that. Unfortunately, I'm going to turn the big light off because um, it doesn't look like we've got anything happening with the Magic Eye, which is a real shame because, again, like the V-Door, they just don't... Um... Oh, there is, a, there is a little bit of green glow I can see leaning in, the, in here. It is actually functioning. The Magic Eye has got some green in there. You just can't really see it on the camera because of the angle that it's at. Maybe there's a very faint glow there. So that's something which is a total disaster as well. Um, so that's nice because obviously, you know, these unit, these things are getting, these magic eyes are really rare. That particular Mullard 34 is, they're just, you know, there's very few on eBay. Um, and people are charging a fortune for them there. You know, a hundred people are charging a hundred pounds for them for, you know, a hundred percent tested, uh, tested good valves. Um, I think there was another one that I saw. There was three actually. There was a f one one for fifty pounds that was tested at fifty percent. Uh, you know, uh, seventy pounds for a seventy percent tested one, and a fully hundred percent uh, valve tested. He was charging a hundred pound for it, which is just insane. But, you know, I suppose if you, like anything else, scarcity dictates price. So, um, it's just the way it is. Right, 226, no more movement. And 210 mains input. So, uh, let's switch her off and try the mains. Immediately. You can see the exponential drop once you get the higher the voltage, how much quickly a unit discharges when it's actually at a high voltage. It's extremely quick. Because obviously that voltage just pushes all of the available charge straight through the already conducting, very well conducting valves. So that all of the charge that's built up on the caps just goes straight through the valves and down to earth as soon as the power's uh, switched off. Okay, um, I'll pull the plug out and uh, next thing will be the mains test. Right, I haven't got any other crop clips so I'll do the mains test now because they're being used here to measure on this meter and then once I know it works on the mains I'll shut it off and then use these crop clips to attach to the speakers and then fire it up again on the mains and see if we can actually get any sound out of it um, and let's see I'll, I'll put an aerial cable into the aerial over here and see if it actually is making any noise right here we go on the mains see what happens Right, full mains UK voltage, 243 volts or so, and rapidly climbing to its DC rail voltage, which is, ooh, it's getting, it's uh, looking like it's going to be around about the two, 270 mark or less. Okay, 260, 260 volts DC at 243 RMS mains in. So, 
just hang on a minute. I'm going to leave this for a minute so that it has actually stabilised and I know exactly what the rail voltage is. I want to know what the maximum voltage that I'd be dealing with with the, this unit. So I'll come back in a minute, in a second rather. Okay, something's starting to smoke so I'm switching it off. Right, been good to know where it's coming from. Can't actually see. Looks like quite a lot all over it, really. Not really sure. I mean, that it, that could be, uh, you know, residue from the paint and stuff as something's getting warm. Or it could just be a failing component, so I don't really want to push that any further. Um, I think I'll let me have a have a think about it and um, what I'm what I want to do next and see where we go from there. Right, I'm just going to turn it back on the mains and look at that again. Um, I've changed the bulb here as well so that uh, I want to know that the actual holder is okay. So I've got a new bulb in there, which we can see is lighting quite nicely. Right, so let's just watch. Let's see what's going on here. So as she's climbing, I want to try and get a better idea whether that smoke's coming from the surface of the amp because it could be just, as the components are getting hot, it could be just a bit of the shit that was all over it. It was like an oily kind of grease or whether it's the casing of the transformer or whether it's, uh, I could do with an infrared camera now to actually see which component, if any, or which one is actually... Um, Maybe where that where smoke's coming from. So, but nothing. It's not failing, which is great. So it seems like it may just be as the valves are heating up and uh, just a bit of crap and um, stuff you know that may have been on the valves as they're now up to getting. They're going to be running at full temperature, obviously, because they're running at full power. So. It hasn't come back the smoke, so with a bit of luck, that will be just as the unit. Let me just smell white spirit, really. So I, I, I don't think it is a component. Whatever it was, hopefully it was surface crap or an oil and a bit of white spirit and all mixed in, and it's burnt off with the heat. So it's certainly I can smell. I can smell now that you know that it's hot. It could be the coating on the transformer because obviously everything got brushed with IPA and there's probably you know the actual um, chemicals that make up the transformer that, that you know they're probably getting hot. Old transformer, the chemicals in them haven't been run probably maybe for a while. Who knows how long the uh, that lead has been disconnected from? It was connected disconnected from the off on off switch that someone's you know it could have been like that for years which is why no one's you know it might not have been switched on for a long time this thing um, and once that lead had broken inside then obviously people wouldn't be able to turn it on they'd have just assumed oh well it's knackered you know and it's, it's gone out with the house clearance or left as junk or whatever to end up in the junk shop so right I'm seeing the smoke again now but there's nothing difficult to tell whether it's coming from the underside or the top. I think it's just, uh, it's coming from, I think it's coming from the rectifier valve. And I, it's that, because that's tucked under that bar, I probably didn't get in to wipe the shit that's off it uh, with the brush because that's still the rest have got you know I did wipe them which is when I wiped the decals off but I missed I can still see sort of bits of crap on the actual rectifier so now that that's got full current going through it it's probably burning off the shit that's on the outside of the valve with a bit of luck so hopefully it, that's all it is yeah it's definitely coming from the rectifier valve and it looks to be on the top side here. So what I can do is turn that off, um, give that a bit of a wipe, 
and get that crap off and see how we go. And then I'll plug the speakers in before I fire it up again and see if she makes any noise. So less than five seconds there, she's down to five volts or around the five, just under, well, and certainly under 10 seconds. I'm going to fire up on 240 volts again. I've got a piece of wire in as a sort of an aerial, and I've got the speakers attached here by crop clips. So uh, let's see what happens. Um, and I'll tune the dial in and see if we can get any sound or what might happen. Right, obviously I haven't got the... Uh, the AC meter attached, so only now reading the DC rail. Crop clip, uh, the crop clip came off where it was there, so it's just uh, attached to the ground, which is the chassis. Anyway, so up to full voltage, near enough. So 262, just turn up the volume a bit. I'll turn the TV down, that is, fully. Right, but I don't hear any mains hum at all. So that should be full volume. So let's just leave that a little bit off full volume. Now the trouble is, there are so many uh, channels with this thing that are on the pre-selectors. Right, so that's end to end on whatever channel it's on. And I don't hear anything out of the uh, speaker at all, but it could be, you know, obviously it's, it could be just a very quiet unit. But it's looking like it might actually have an audio transformer output, audio valve, or certainly the audio stage, or even a Duff speaker. I'll test this. Um, I'll test the speaker in a minute and check that's got eight ohms across it, or whatever, whatever value it should be. To check the actual speaker's not blown. But yeah, I don't think much is going on on the output stage here. No crackles or pops or anything. So maybe that was the, the original fault with this unit in the first place before the on the on switch wire broke. Maybe it's just dead tube or one of those two output tubes, the EL41s, but then if that was the case, yeah, if one of them could could be blown, or both, um, one or the other, or the audio transformer or the speaker. So I'll rule out the speaker first. I'll just do a an ohms measurement on the speaker. Switch it off a minute. Right, just measuring the speaker. So you can see there, I've got eight ohms. Allowing for a one ohm for the lead, but anyway, it's DC, so it doesn't. It's only an indication. It's not what the AC voltage would, uh, the AC re reactance would be of the speaker. So the speaker's okay. Um, let's read across the speaker outputs, and that would tell me at least whether the uh, output coil. We're only getting, yeah, let's say, three and a half ohms there, including the lead resistance. That would be so. Uh, so about one and a half ohms. So there's something on the on the uh, output transformer secondary. So now it's either you know it could be a failed capacitor in uh, the signal chain somewhere, one of the electrolytics or something in the signal chain. Uh, I'll have to look at the circuit diagram or the primary of the um, output stage transformer or the valves. Um, one or the other or both of the output valves not working so but generally you know really pleased uh, so 
you can see the benefits of uh, hopefully appreciate the benefits again as we've said that, um, of you know going to the trouble of building uh, for, well it's no trouble just to build a, a dim bulb tester and you know give a unit a fighting chance uh, for those capacitors to reform and at least then be in a better position to um, diagnose uh, other things afterwards knowing that the unit overall is actually functional um, so I hope you found it interesting um, I certainly have I've enjoyed it so so uh, I'll um, you know I, I probably will I don't know yet just yet but I, I'd like to uh, invest in a in a better overhead system um, because obviously this camera is very blurry it's not particularly great the sound quality is pretty good but the of the microphone but the the actual picture quality I need to be able to zoom in and so if anybody would like to leave a comment um, if they if you know like a you know not too expensive just you know something as cheap as chips really would be ideal because this channel doesn't make any money um, unfortunately I just don't have the subscribership um, to justify really expensive kit but um, I would like you know a decent overhead unit that's you know do 1080p uh, it would have to have a tripod type of or an arm, you know, some kind of support that's at least say two and a half to three feet above the desk, and a particular uh, d digital camera that may, you know, has a screen on it, so you can tilt that and actually see the screen yourself and what you're filming, with a zoom capability. If any, you know, anybody's got any suggestions on, you know, a, a reasonably priced, you know, model of of that kind of kit, then you know, I'd really appreciate some feedback on that. That would be nice. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed watching this part of it. And then as I dig more, dig a bit deeper into this over the next few days or whenever, try and identify what the actual fault is, why there's no sound, and, and go from there. But so far, it's off to a really good start. So um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much for watching.